in a minute. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Danish Bahati. I'm uh, chair for Apna Merit for 2021. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all for today's session on healthcare research and innovation landscape in Pakistan webinar series. This is a series of webinars being conducted by Apna Merit in collaboration with Apna Risa Committee, who have been very kind and gracious to uh, support us um, for the um, uh, education grant for helping cover the cost for CME. So this is a ACCME accredited CME activity uh, being, uh, CME is being offered by APNA in, in collaboration with their partners, AMEDCO. Uh, this is, um, uh, we are issuing CMEs every quarter. So every 12 webinars or so, and we'll keep a track of your attendance and then you'll complete a survey to get your CME credits for joining this session. Um, the, as you guys know, the purpose of these webinar series have been to invite uh, leadership in healthcare research and innovation from Pakistan, within Pakistani diaspora in North America, to understand all the potentials and possibilities of uh, things in Pakistan, how to leapfrog Pakistan's healthcare research and innovation, uh, for us to learn as APNA Merit members, uh, and for us to plan and think and envision uh, what can we do to support these efforts in Pakistan. Uh, this will be followed by an international research and innovation uh, in healthcare meeting in uh, Pakistan, in Islamabad. The date is set uh, for December 22nd uh, in Rawalpindi. Rawalpindi Medical University will be hosting it. And hopefully, uh, we'll have a collaboration with HEC and many of our leader leading institutions uh, to do this conference to discuss the lessons learned and way forward uh, in that meeting. So with that, um, uh, let me start the session for today. As you guys know that we will, uh, after our presentation from the speaker, we'll have time for some Q&A. Uh, we'll invite uh, comments and questions from all of you. Uh, you can raise your hand if you would like to uh, get the microphone. Uh, encourage all of you to introduce yourself in the chat box. You can ask questions in Q&A, part of the Zoom. Uh, webinar and uh, and let us know uh, what, what uh, thoughts or questions you might have. So it's my pleasure to invite the speaker for today, um, Dr. Tariq Zaman, uh, another uh, bright and brilliant uh, researcher from Pakistani descent. Uh, it uh, it really gives me great pleasure when I have uh, thorough researchers uh, like uh, Dr. Zaman uh, present. Uh, because uh, we need to see what true research looks like and, and what bench research and translational research looks like. And, and that can really give us a lot of great directions for future. Dr. Tariq Zaman is a research uh, professor at Michigan State University. He has been working on neurological disorders since 2005. He has worked at Brain Science Institute, KIST Korea, the Ottawa Hospital in Western University, Canada, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Michigan State University in USA. Uh, key genes function flagged by his name are uh, calcium, voltage-gated calcium channel CAV 2.3 in Epson's epilepsy, uh, LMO4 in hyperphagia in autism, uh, SNC, SCN3A in infantile epilepsy, uh, SN, SN, SCN3A in brain development, uh, SCN8A in childhood epilepsy, and a KIT kit in autism and albinism. So he is a true bench researcher and we have invited Dr. Zaman to talk about early infantile epilepsy uh, as a model for discussions on genes, pathophysiology, in utero manipulation, precision medicine, and hopefully we will conclude the discussions on uh, what are the potential opportunities for Pakistan. With that, uh, Dr. Tariq Zaman, let me hand over the stage to you. Please go ahead and unmute yourself.
Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Assalamu alaikum and hello to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bhatti, for a detailed introduction. It's a great honor for me to be invited for a virtual talk for the members of APNA. Do you know that epilepsy is one of the oldest recognized condition with the written evidence dating back to 4000 BC? The prevalence of epilepsy to same extent reflects the lack of progress in combating one of the oldest health problems that results from an abnormal electrical activity within the brain, the most complex and mysterious object in the known universe. Human brain contains 10 billion tiny computers we call neurons. Each one is connected to 10,000 others through fine wires we call dendrites and exons. Each neuron works like a supercomputer that computes and converts chemical signal into electrical signal using tons of different types of molecular machines. We call them ion channels. Genetic alteration or abnormal expression of these molecular machines or ion channels or gates are proved to be associated with most of the epilepsies. So only one third of epilepsy is due to brain insult and that is avoidable. However, two third is influenced by genetics and needs genomic medicine to combat complex neurological condition. Therefore, understanding of genes and their variants and how they drive health, disease, and drug responses in each person is critical for personalized or genomic medicine. So before going to my talk, I am bound to actually read this disclosure statement. As a leading investigator, I declare that I have no relevant or uh, financial interest that relate to the research described in this talk. Though we have established some Christian medicine that was given at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and that was the part of research. So for the last two decades, I have been focused on investigating the function of different genes that encodes different ion channels. And I'm also working on bridging the gaps between mechanistic investigation and complex behaviors, and also involved in gene manipulations within the uterus using viral strategies and also manipulation bidirectionally, a specific set of neurons within brain using chemogenetics or pharmacogenetics and optogenetics. So currently I'm working on a rewiring brain, how to rewire the brain circuits and also developing some Christian medicine. So, for those who are interested uh, briefly, or suppose who are interested in my research or in collaboration, they should know that I have been working at Brain Science Institute, Korea. And here basically, I have investigated functional role of CAV 2.3 in rhythmicity related to absence epilepsy. So this is a benchmark study that I have been using throughout. So in this case, we genetically targeted calcium channel that is known as CAV 2.3. So the previously, there were classification that classified calcium channels into two groups, low voltage and high voltage. There was only one study in non-neuronal cell lines indicating that these channels might be a uh, medium voltage activated. So we were the first who actually genetically targeted these animal, means these genes in animal models. And then we performed electrophysiology and some EEG and a lot more other studies. And this is the first study that actually established the causal link of calcium channels 
with epilepsy and provided a strong evidence that these channels are medium voltage activated channels. So if you look at just, I'm giving you the brief overview that this is a wild type cell recorded from a thalamocortical circuit. You can see the green fluorescent neuron that is a reticular thalamic nuclei. And this is a single neuron that's been patched for electrophysiology. And these are the electrophysiological traces from wild type means the normal cell and the knockout where the gene was knocked out. So you could see a rhythmic bus discharge when we evoked this neuron. And this is very much common in sleep and also been linked to absence epilepsy. But when we knock this out, so you could see initiation is still there, but we can't see a rhythmic bus discharge. So that terminated premature, indicating that this channel is critical for rhythmicity. Okay, going back to the overview, uh, so that's the one that actually I mentioned uh, a little bit more detail because this is a benchmark study. And then later moved to Korea, sorry, Canada here at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. I worked on again on ion channels and targeted LMO4 gene. That is a transcriptional cofactor. It helps expression of other channels in this case, calcium channels. So we knocked this out and we found that the calcium channel expression was down in a region that is known to be important for homeostasis. Once it's been knocked out, there was hyperphagia phenotype. And interestingly here, we used another chemogenetic approach. That means the combination of drug and genetics to rescue the phenotype. So in this case, we could turn on and off of one particular region of the brain, and we could actually replicate whatever we found in knockout. I later moved to the Schulich School of Medicine in London, Ontario, Canada. So here I investigated functional role of calcium dependent potassium channel. That's a big potassium channel, shortly you can say DK channel. And that function we discovered was in sensory filtering related to autism and schizophrenia. So then move to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. That is one of the finest children's hospital in the United States. So here I worked on two channels and those are sodium channels, SCN3A and SCN8A. So whole exome sequencing helped us to discover that there are some mutations that are been associated with infantile or childhood epilepsy. And this is actually the study that I'm going to talk about. So the early infantile epileptic encephalopathy that affects newborns within first few days or weeks of their life. And this type of epilepsy is resistant to standard anti-epileptic drugs. Mortality is 50% within weeks to months. If we look at the genetic cause, there are many different genes been associated, mostly the ion channel, like the potassium channel type KCN Q2, voltage gated sodium channel, voltage gated calcium channels, and likely others. So let's see what are the voltage gated ion channels. So in general, there are two bigger classes of the ion channel. One is the voltage gated and other is the ligand gated. So the voltage gated channels, you could see these are embedded in the cell membrane. And while there is a change in the voltage in the membrane, the sense that change and they change their conformational state. It means they, once they are closed, they open by sensing the change in the voltage. And by opening the channel, they provide a passage to the ions that can cross through this channel into the cell. And this could actually charge up the neuron or the soma. So once you will see on the left ones, uh, the soma is charged up, it can further trigger exon hillock, and that is actually highly concentrated with sodium channel. 
The large morsodium channels are densely expressed in this area. And this area actually triggers the action potential. And that can further propagate through the axon, again, through sodium channel. So in general, the sodium channels are the channels that can decide whether they have to fire or they don't have to. And the calcium channels, they play a role in determining the excitability. And the potassium channels, their work is to calm down the cell, means bring the cell back to resting. So once this soma is charged, and the action potential is fired here at this position, it travels down. And this voltage change basically travels down to the axon terminals. And these terminals, they have a lot more voltage gated calcium channels. When I say the voltage gated means they sense the voltage change, whether they are calcium, potassium, or sodium. They work in response to change in voltage. So once there is a voltage delivered here, so now they are open. So once they're open, they release the vesicle, the transmitters. So they could be either glutamate that actually works as the excitability and uh, the GABA that actually turn off the next neuron that actually inhibit the activity. So the both glutamate and GABA, they have different receptors on the next neuron that is downstream or the postsynaptic neuron. There are a lot more ligand gated ion channels we can say glutamate receptors, AMPA receptors, and NMDA, these are two types. And in GABA, there are GABA A and GABA B receptors, but they sense the chemical released in this synaptic gap. So once they sense that, they convert this chemical signal into electrical signal, and now the neuron actually computes, it integrates all those signals, and then release that information in terms of the voltage change to hexon hillock and then this fire another action potential. So this is a way that two neurons communicate by converting chemical to electrical, electrical to chemical signals. And there are a lot more other factors involved. So, so voltage gated channels are of four types, sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. So there are many different types, further types within these groups. Each has very different expression profile, voltage sensitivity, drug sensitivity, and functional characteristics. So if we look at the sodium channel, so they are important because they decide whether to fire or not. Once they fire the action potential, then they propagate the action potential throughout the axon. And there are actually nine types in human brain, uh, not in human brain, overall in human, or are predominantly expressed in brain. These are the type one, two, three, and six. So these red marks, actually, these are those channels that I have investigated. And these four channels that expresses in brain, they are associated with epilepsy and polymicrogyria. And the rest are four, five, seven, eight, nine. These are expressed in spinal cord or peripheral nervous system, DRG. And they are associated with pain like salmon, myotonia, others, and heart attack like 1.5. So if we look at the calcium channel, they have three categories. So low voltage, high voltage, and this is the one that I have worked on and uh, established that this is a medium voltage activated channel. And that we found in epilepsy, and these are also involved in epilepsy. High voltage are mainly in tachycardia, autism, ataxia, and also in epilepsy. So the potassium channel, these are also uh, important channels because they turn off the neuron. Uh, you can say they reset the neuron, they calm down the neuron. So they are also sensitive to voltage sensitive to ATP and also sensitive to calcium increase. So my interest throughout was the calcium channels, calcium dependent mechanisms and some other channel like the sodium. So I invested these two channels out of five calcium sensitive channels, BK and SK, one in autism like BK and SK in epilepsy and ataxia. 
if we look at sodium channel that I worked on, this is actually SCN3A and HA. So, so both are involved actually in epilepsy. SCN3A is involved in infantile epilepsy that has been published in 2018. And this one, uh, we've more closely looked at its embryonic role and in epilepsy and the uh, polymicrogyria and also the SCN8A in childhood epilepsy. So there are actually 28 variants that we found throughout the world in collaboration with many different institutes. And we genetically engineered those and we looked at function of these variants, like 28 variants from these two channels and investigated what happens at cell level. My focus is SCN3A for this talk. So let's focus on this channel. So SCN3A is a basically gene name. That is a DNA part. But NAV1.3 is a sodium channel gene, I mean a name. So channel is like a gate. So it works like a gate. It has many different components. If we look at the location, so this SCN3A is located on chromosome two. And there are some other sodium genes that are also located in this area. And when we look at its expression profile, it expresses in fetal brain, starting from 16 weeks of gestation up to the birth. And in human, it still stays on for some time during the development, even after birth. But in rodent model, it expresses only before birth. Just after birth, it goes down. So what happens actually, it, it is replaced by SCN1A. So 1A is another sodium channel that stays throughout the life. But SCN3A is basically very much important in early life, in the fetal life, in development age. So, that's why we have seen in some cases there was epilepsy, but there was in addition to epilepsy, there was some developmental issue. And that because it expresses very early. So in this case, like SGN3A, we looked at 20 different variants. And these 20 variants were actually found throughout the world. So that's why you will see a very long list of authors in this study. So I worked as a leading author in this, in this study. So basically most of the institutes or the hospitals, they provided us the information that they found something new that's not treatable. And when we looked at the genetics, we found that there are some new variants and new means de novo variants are the de novo point mutations. So de novo means something new that was never reported before. And more importantly, that was never inherited from the parents. So it means there was nothing wrong with parents. Something newly generated, either during gametogenesis or during development after fertilization, because when every cell replicates, it replicates its DNA. So sometimes there is an error in replication process and it can introduce some mutation. And in this case, we found very rare mutations. So that's why you will see one patient in Norway, one patient in the United States. So these are the types of epilepsies that we actually worked at very much beginning. So as I mentioned, we worked on 20 different variants of this channel because there were 20 different variations. So far, just for simplicity, I'm showing just one here and few other examples. So if you look at this variant, so at amino acid level, we say I875T means isoleucine was substituted to threonine. And why it's been substituted? Because there was change at DNA level at this point, 2624, T was substituted with C, 
So that actually changed one amino acid. So one amino acid change caused a severe epilepsy plus polymicrogyria in humans. But when we look at other species, again, for this mutation, exactly at the same level of the amino acid, this is amino acid sequence, you could see human, snake, cuckoo, mouse, and brown bat. These are entirely different species, but their amino acid sequence is exactly 100% same. Means they're highly conserved. And this part of sodium channel is highly conserved, indicating that this channel does not tolerate any change. If there is change, that could be pathogenic. So that's how when we do whole exome sequencing, we see where is actually this mutation has been reported or variation basically. And then we use different programs to see whether it could be pathogenic or this is just for variation because we everybody has 0.1% variation compared to other human being and 1% to even compared to the mouse. So this 0.1% variation that makes us different but sometimes this variation could be pathogenic. So there are thousands of variations that we can detect through the whole exome sequencing. And if we start investigating those thousands, it takes years. But we, we narrow down using the programs, we look at oh, where which area is actually been variated. Is it highly conserved? Or is there any, suppose if we compare with the data bank, there are like, 40,000 suppose the sequence are I think more than that. So when we compared with that, so there is no single change in this area in all those thousands of the people, those were reported normal. So that indicates that there's something wrong with this gene. And our task is to look at how it actually contributes to the pathogenicity. As I mentioned, this causes also the polymicrogyria. This is the MRI from the patient that was at our hospital. And if you see this cartoon, this explains uh, somehow better about the polymicrogyria. You could see this diffuse brain. Normally, you know, the, the brain has many folds and purpose is to increase the surface area. I Means the, the animals with the bigger brain, they have much bigger folds. And in this case, there are many folds. That's why it's called poly and very small in size. That's why they call micro I means the folds. So this condition, very small and many folds that can actually impact cognitive functions and learning. Okay, so here is the overview this slide gives overview of the all approaches that we use to tackle or to use to translate this research up to the precision medicine. So the first thing that we did is actually everywhere, wherever the patient was seen, they did the EEG just to see whether there is normal or abnormal electrical activity in the brain and the next was to see at the genetic level using whole exome sequencing. So there are two different sequencing, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. Whole genome actually actually sequenced almost 3 billion, 3.1 billion, uh, the DNA codes to see whether there is a variation. But whole exome sequence only those parts of the genome that are very much important for, for the protein synthesis. So MRI was used to look at brain development or the abnormalities. And once we found some variation and we used different programs to confirm that there is pathogenic variants, we synthesized those are genetically engineered those mutations. Basically, we generated a new channel that has everything same, just one base was changed, exactly like the patient. And then we express those channels into human embryonic kidney cells. 
So these are the cells that don't express sodium channels. So this is a good model to see how channels behave wild type versus the mutants. And how we did, we did electrophysiologically, we confirmed. So whenever we found some abnormality in electrophysiology, we applied some approved anti-epileptic drugs so that we could see whether these drugs could be a better candidate. But the most importantly, because these cells are non-neuronal cells, so we don't know what happens in neurons in intact brain. So the next was, the best strategy was to make a short, quick animal model. And for that, we used uh, the rodents and we actually manipulated the gene in, in the fetal brain while the, brain, the fetus is sitting in the womb. And we injected wild type in one group and mutated channel in another group tagged with the fluorescent green fluorescent light. So once this animal was born, we could see the glowing brain with the green fluorescent protein. We sliced that brain and then we looked at electrophysiology means intrinsic property of those neurons, how they behave. So once we found that they have different behavior, we applied again approved anti-epileptic drugs to see which one has the better effect on which particular gene type like the mutations. So we found few medicine work very well against some mutations and then we suggested those as a precision medicine for those epileptic patients at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So for better understanding of sodium channel, let's look at this cartoon. This is a 2D farm. As I mentioned, the sodium channel is actually a gate. It has two important components, alpha and beta. The beta has many different types, but their function is just sportive. They help them to localize in the membrane. But this one is very important because this is the one that controls the gate. This is actual gate. It has four domains for all nine types. Each domain has six transmembranes. And you will see these pink one in all, they have different function, but the black one is the important one to sense the voltage. If there is a variation in this one, there will be issue with the voltage sensing. And this loop between transmembrane five and six, this is ion selectivity loop, means it selects which ion should pass through this channel. Because this channel is a sodium channel, it allows only sodium, not other ions like calcium and potassium. So this loop between domain three and four is very much important to close the channel, means to make it inactive so that there should not be bombardment of ions inwards or into the cell. So let's see how it works because these things actually help you to understand better the my electrophysiology results. So the channel has basically three conformational states. It has three states. So it could be either closed. When there is no higher voltage, it will be closed and it will be closed from the extracellular side, from the outer side. So sodium will be bounced back. It will not enter into the cell and it's closed. At the signal level, you will see very much flat signal. Number one is a flat signal indicating this, this state. When there is a change, when this neuron gets signals from upstream neuron, and it actually changes the voltage. When there is a voltage change in the membrane, so the channel senses that one and then it opens. When it opens, it allows the sodium ions to go into the soma or the cell membrane. And that has been reflected here, number two. There's a huge invert current. And the sodium channel opens and goes to the peak in 0.5 millisecond. That means 2,000 part of one second, they get the peak. They're so fast you will not see any protein faster than this protein. That's why it's very sensitive. But once they get the P, now the cell don't need too much sodium. There is a lot more voltage in the membrane. So voltage keeps the channel open 
but important is that even it is open it should not take the sodium in so there is another gate inactivation gate that is in, on intracellular side it closes when it closes it does not allow sodium even sodium channel is open this is a third state signal goes back to normal flat still there is some leak current compared to other sodium channel this channel has a little bit higher leak current but in the patients we found interestingly so this inactivation gate is not fully closed that means it does it does show some leaky or persistent current or impure channel and this trace actually explains very well it shows that when channel is closed there is no leak when channel opens it gets peak like a normal but after peak when it should go back to inactivation state it does not go that fast even after hundreds of milliseconds there is lot more sodium current coming in that's why you will see this this signal it should go back to the level of 1 so that indicates this this inactivation gate is stuck open means it is still leaking some sodium in so let's now look at actual data so again there are 20 variants but just for simplicity i'm showing only three variants plus the control the a is actually the family of electrical traces you will see lot more traces in white green red and blue so each one is actually the response to different test potentials so we check this channel at many different test potentials here it's been shown from minus 80 up to plus 40 millivolt so the wild type you could see all the traces in all test potentials channel open very quick and then start closing and it gets very much flat signal after few milliseconds so this is 20 millisecond uh, total trace but in this uh, i875t that the, the example that i have shown it has my polymicrogyria plus epilepsy so this one shows very much quick opening opening is fine but you will see the signal does not flat quicker it shows some persistent sodium current i means current that is actually the french word intestinal due current like that so basically this is taken from that so n means sodium p means persistent in the sodium current that is persistently coming in has been reflected here in the traces and this is a transient current sodium transient current means the current that stays very the fraction of you know the second even a millisecond so the same case in other variation there is a persistent smaller than this but still higher than the wild type and this channel shows very big persistent current huge persistent current but when we looked at the iv curve that gives some more information because traces give very clear persistent current but when we plotted the voltage test potential against Uh, the transient current in density so we could see these green and red they can turn on earlier means their threshold been messed up so that means when there is a small input so the neuron will fire action potential means it's been sensitized other than increased persistent current this green one lies in the middle compared with these two and the wild type the black one so shows that it has huge persistent and even small left shift so the bottom message basically the take home message is that these channels shifted their threshold and also the persistent or leaky uh, leaky current is been increased so the next question was to look at more closely persistent current so because that experiment was just to see activation curve plus to some extent the persistent current but this experiment was mainly designed 
look at the persistence. So here we delivered 10 times longer pulse at one test potential. That was minus 10 millivolt. And that is the higher peak for the normal one, like for, for the wild type. So you could see here, when we delivered longer pulse, this channel activated quick and then turned off very quick. And it went back to almost, almost flat. It is two, 3% leaky current. That's normal for this channel. But this channel, even for the longer duration pulse, still it is stuck open, it's leaking the current. That means it is causing excitability of the neurons. And that neuron, one, one neuron is excitable. So you know that one neuron could be connected to 10,000 other neurons. So, so one, it's not only one neuron, there could be thousands or hundreds of the neurons that are expressing this channel. Once they trigger, they trigger millions of other neurons and then circuits, one circuit, two circuits, then whole brain. So then the whole brain will spark electric current that could be reflected through the EEG. So in all three, you could see very much high persistent, high persistent. And this is a graphical presentation of how much persistent current we have observed compared to this transient one. So this one is showing much higher over 30%. This one is showing close to 20%. This one slightly over 10%. So any persistent current that exceeds over 5% can trigger epilepsy. So these basically all three currents are much higher than the trigger point. So the short message from here is that we confirm there is persistent current. And next question was, there are so many other experiments, I'm just showing a few, was to see, because this is just uh, the non-neuronal cell lines, was to see whether there is the difference at neuron level. So what we did, we actually electroporated these channels, control versus mutant, in the brain while the fetus is sitting in the uterus. So this is a cartoon showing that the DNA was mixed with the dye and we injected into the brain in the cortical area. And then we can visualize through the dye that oh, DNA is there. So once it's there, then we electroporate. We give some shock, electric shock, because DNA moves towards the positive electrode. So that actually incorporate the plasmid DNA into the neurons. And in case of, if we don't wanna do electroporation, then there could be a viral strategy. We can pack the DNA into virus and virus can go into the cell and can express these channels. But this channel is very big in size. It is 6,000 base pair cDNA. Plus if we add some promoter, so this is too big for the virus to handle. So that's why we use electroporation. And after birth, we could see the green brain indicating that there is gene incorporated because gene, what we introduce is actually including another gene that gives green light. So this animal was sliced after birth. And you could see this is a brain from the animal. When we close some certain wavelength of the light, you will see the brain is glowing green, indicating that this is the brain that we actually manipulated. And when we closely look at uh, the microscope level, you would see the cells. These are the neurons showing green fluorescent protein, indicating that these are the cells that are expressing either wild type or the mutant channel. And the next task was to look at electrophysiology to see intrinsic firing properties. Here you could see we did some um, the patch clamping and you could see the wild type cell that are expressing actually the normal healthy channels. They have not shown any abnormal electric activity. They're showing very much a regular firing, tonic firing, single spike uh, at resting means we have not injected anything. So these are uh, the neurons firing at resting. But in mutant, you will see there is a burst of spikes, then resting, burst of spike. And this is basically the burst is dangerous, means it can cause overexcitability. And that is a characteristic of epilepsy at cell level. So the message from this regard that this channel is basically 
has some role in voltage sensitivity and leakiness and excitability. We confirmed at many different levels. So the next phase was to develop the precision medicine. So we, so the strategy in the research and even in you know the innovative uh, approaches is that to target the persistent current. That is a therapeutic strategy. And when we look at the agents that can block this persistent current, there are few sodium channel blockers that's been not described previously, or if there is, uh, there is a little data. So we tried actually those uh, anti-epileptic drugs that are associated with sodium channel blocking. In this case, I'm showing just two sick and one control. You could see this white trace for the wild type is basically I mean, control condition. And when we applied the lecosamide, there's a drug that can, that can attach to sodium channel and it actually changes its activity. So because wild type does not show any persistence, so it, does, it stays very much same. So in this case, the green is actually the sick one in control condition means when there was no drug. And when we applied the drug, you could see this trace is showing that there is a lot more reduction in leakiness. Means this is the right drug for this particular patient. And in other patient, still this alcozamide worked, but not to the same extent as for I875T. So graphical presentation shows that over two-third persistent current was reduced when we used lecosamide. And in this case, almost 50%, still good, but we found another drug much better for this patient, and that was phenytoin or dilantin. And again, we always run control, and control is very much similar, but here you could see much bigger than even this one, it's almost 70% of persistent current was reduced when we applied phenytoin or dilantin. And this blue trace is basically without drug and this gray is with drug. So this is the graph showing how much persistent or pathogenic current was reduced. So the take home message from this is that these anti-epileptic drugs, they are very much specific to certain mutations. So based on this study, we got another $2 million from NIH to look at brain development more closely. And we thank GenScript that helped us and IPSC core facility at the Penn Medicine. Uh, they provided us induced pluripotent stem cells. And even we are working on precision medicine using these stem cells and Epilepsy Foundation. And this is an engine based on my work. We, we published three papers and we are the first at this hospital that worked on infantile or the child had good epilepsy. So based on this research, we even got the internal funding from the CHOP and we started a program called engine means epilepsy neurogenetics initiative. So this is actually purely working on the epilepsy and serving the patients. And the dream is to basically to edit the genome that's been not allowed now, but we already have used the CRISPR approach to modify the genome of the animal model. So once it's been successful, maybe at certain points, we will, uh, we will be allowed to specifically manipulate the gene that's been pathogenic. But more importantly, we developed some precision medicine, a medicine that actually has been designed or been picked or selected based on knowing the genetics of the patient. So that's all for this presentation. Any question? Thank you so much, Dr. Zaman. <clears throat> okay. um, I think um, 
now this this presentation although it looks very uh, complicated and difficult but i think it's important to to realize that we need to have familiarity of what actually goes into finding an answer that we take for granted you know mm -hmm. we take for granted that we have these sodium channel blockers for epilepsy and somebody just tell us prescribe phenytoin and we give 100 mg pid and we're great we know feel, we feel like uh, we're king we know how to treat epilepsy but we forget or we don't realize we're blind to all the efforts necessary to put together two and two on why using sodium channel blocker for epilepsy makes sense in what kind of epilepsies it makes sense in what future epilepsies it will be useful and where it has not helped and why it has not helped and all of that is the key components that build the medicine but i would like uh, dr zaman uh, for you to comment uh, a, as a researcher someone who has done all of this um, on some questions that that you know that may not be very obvious to to some of us uh, so I, i'm going to just ask them one by one these are broad level questions these are high level questions and uh, you know if you want to be brief that's fine uh, before i go on and invite some of the comments i see some hand raised and i would love to hear what they have to say so first question that comes to my mind is that how do you see the translational value of these researches in healthcare practice and delivery in general but also what value do you see for translation of this work within pakistan when started in pakistan so if someone in pakistan is doing a genetic research and figuring out some things that are local how would pakistani clinician will benefit from a research like that you know down the road let's say 10 years from now 15 years from now right. uh, and, and you know i saw that you did mention one thing there that you found out based on your research uh, what kind of drugs may be more useful for a particular kind, kind of genetic mm -hmm. epilepsy so that kind of question uh, i would like you to comment on and make it maybe a little more obvious to some of our audience yeah so uh, in general this is very much new approach because that's you could see like uh, this has been done at boston children hospital and chop the philadelphia hospital these are the the highest ranked in united states they just started this translational research and precision medicine but this uh, this generalized basically study give idea for those researchers who are interested to work on this precision medicine that is actually the future of the medicine by understanding you know the genetics so i think this is a huge development that's why you could see uh, these epilepsies are dated back 4000 bc and we are trying to figure out we have not found anything It means we can't surgically remove we can't control even through the blockers because uh, that does block so many other things but precision targeting or the medicine that is something that can uh, give some better relief uh, in terms of the pakistan because that's not uh, highly advanced in research but that has very unique variations and that variants if not studied anywhere we don't know which drug will work better for them we can't do some hit and trial but uh, the best is to Uh, look for those in the variants in this study what we have done is actually we got the variants mostly from united states then canada and europe and only few from middle east so the variants in our population like the pakistani population is not that much characterized so as mentioned few months ago that i also worked on thalassemia a lot more variation is there that's been well studied and that group actually collaborated with many different european institutes that they made very good papers just because of that collaboration but actual uh, you know the core facilities don't exist in pakistan for that we have to do something and uh, basically i have a I mean big desire and wish that i should go there and should establish because uh, that's something that's in my mind my heart brain is connected with my homeland so let's see if i can i i would definitely do whatever i can great so uh, i have three more other questions but before i go to them uh, i'm going to in, uh, involve some of our our uh, 
uh, audience here for their comments and question but I, let me add very quickly that um, you know when i go to pakistan i see these uh, young onset movement disorders or epilepsies which are very complicated lot of unusual feature and the local experts ask me you know what what should we try what's your recommendation and i make a suggestion based on something similar that i've seen but probably not exactly the same and that's where we should envision a future where you know 10 years down the road that there yeah. is a supply chain where those patients can be sampled sent to those labs found the answers what unique thing they have and what will be the right medications for those patients because they will not respond to my suggestions based on my patients in nebraska and that's mm-hmm. what's happening that all these unique unusual cases uh, mm-hmm. are, are you know rare syndromes genetic syndromes i make recommendations and they don't work because you know i don't understand those conditions so, you know i find something similar uh, mm-hmm. here and try to use that but that doesn't work that way very well uh let me invite uh, i saw dr harun durani raise their hand first so dr durani if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, make your comment uh, quickly go ahead dr durani you're muted so actually research in pakistan is very little my question is how can we proceed this procedure in pakistan so that actually ties to my question to dr zaman let me expand on that my question was that you know what resources are needed for these kind of studies how expensive are they and are there ways to subsidize or find funding for those resources for someone who wants to get started in pakistan so recently i was interviewed for aga khan hospital so they were very much interested in you know bringing me there so i talked about you know how much we can start with so oh, actually it, it does take almost 200 to 300 thousand dollars to establish all this like electrophysiology physician medicine and we can start very I mean that a simple level like we can first do the whole exome sequencing in those epileptic patients i am getting actually so many you know request from pakistan we can't actually do the whole exome sequencing for them because here whatever we are paid for we have to follow the guidelines of the institute but anyhow there are so many people are uh, uncharacterized if we do the whole exome sequencing that does cost around 1500 dollars per person so and then based on that we can characterize for characterization we need some cell culture setup or han has that one but they don't have electrophysiology so i propose them that it might cost over 100000 dollars initially it means in pakistani rupees uh, one and a half crore for electrophysiology setup but in general if i want to do everything so it could take 4 to 5 crore so that's something that's manageable because uh, it's not that high so i have this in my mind if i don't get any suppose financial support i'm already talking with those who are that means uh, having a lot more money and they are trying to even donate even i am i have actually myself announced that i will uh, suppose donate 100000 dollars just to start the setup in pakistan so the purpose is to help the people and and we are not losing basically because there are so many people they are going to donate because pakistan is the country that has second highest genetic disorders in the world so, so many other than epilepsy so epilepsy and autism is my area of research but i want to do mostly characterization of genetics of genetic disorders to help them how we can prevent in next generations so for that i have a lot more people interested in actually donating money so if i don't get any you know proper position then i even, even i can start that that program in in pakistan so thank you that it sounds like a lot of money lekin agar main context do without upsetting anyone to ye takriban dha mein ek kanal ka plot hai ya 10 marle ka plot hai jo jo cost hai to do all this genetic research uh, yeah. which is not a lot pakistan mein isse mehangi gaadiyan sadkon par kar rahi hoti hai Uh, yeah. Jenna, uh, right. which I see everywhere. Let me invite one of our uh, regulator, a good friend, mentor, Dr. Abdul Rashid, for for his comments and suggestions. Maybe 
uh, how mm -hmm. this can integrate into our system. Ji, Dr. Sir, Dr. Sheet, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, and I thank everybody. A very good, good presentation by Tarek Sama. Uh, I will be in a better position to explain the research work going to be uh, continued in Pakistan. At the moment, we have received one application from HEJ Karachi University, Karachi. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe I have already mentioned in previous webinars. So uh, one of the research workers, she has done animal studies, or she has also done preclinical studies. And now they want to prove from Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. The, his dossier has been sent to the uh, different members of the clinical study committee in Pakistan. They are evaluating. And the problem is, one of the problem is that they have not got permission from DRAB before conducting the research, this research work. Mm -hmm. So we have to think, we want to encourage the research work in Pakistan, but our rule says that we take before, before start of the research work, get the approval from DRAB. So this will, this will think in the committee of the clinical study committee, which I will chair, inshallah in, uh, in, in August, uh, just to encourage the research worker in Pakistan, as a chairman, my, my support will be that we should at least accept this because this, is, uh, this study is regarding epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And this is first of, first of kind in Pakistan that uh, the animal studies and preclinical studies have been conducted in Pakistan. Uh, the reports from uh, experts is, is, is still waited. Inshallah, uh, we'll decide in the next month, in the, the end of next month. Uh, I think the amount which Tarek Zaman is mentioning is not a big amount. We, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I must say that we, now in Pakistan, COVID vaccines and other uh, a billion dollars clinical studies has been are being conducted in Pakistan and foreign funding is coming here. Um, that I, I hope that can be started in Pakistan. Another if, thing is we have very good facility in Dow University in, for animal studies mm -hmm. and also the also the Karachi University Karachi. And these two, Baha Khan is also good. Hamid Saeed, Saeed Hamid is, is on board with us. So that is also good institution for it as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Dr. Rashid. I, I want to also repeat and stress, Joe, Dr. Sab, it's, um, you know, it's important to follow the regulations and compliance. You know, we don't exist in a bubble. We don't exist, you know, in an independent jungle. We don't exist in a jungle. We don't exist in a jungle. But procedures are placed for a reason and they should be followed. And if you want to be a researcher and want to do clinical trials or translational research or bench research, that's great. But then you need to familiarize yourself on all the regulations that that are surround that for good practices, good ethical practices, even animals. Uh, up, uh, uh, you know, maybe Pakistan may look at aware now that America may animals ke ko bhi rakhne ke liye rules hai, jo patients yeah. se zyada hai, or zyada expensive. Agar, agar aap ye dekhen ki hum animals ko air jo dete hai, wo filtered hoti hai, UV treated hoti hai, uska water tak jo hai, wo UV treated hota hai. Thik hai? ताकि कोई माइक्रोजर्म ना जाए क्योंकि ये ट्रांसजेनिक लाइन इतनी एक्सपेंसिव है इनको बनाने में साल लगते हैं और उनको मेंटेन रखना बहुत एक्सपेंसिव है सो और उनको एक तो ये ना कि ये कि वो उन्हें इंफेक्शन हो दूसरा ये कि इतना ज्यादा हमने जेंटली उनके साथ डील करना है अगर कहीं हम पकड़े गए तो हम पे फाइन हो सकता है बड़ा हैवी बाद दफा बिल्कुल ही हम जॉब से जाते हैं तो इतना आसान नहीं है यहां पे बेसिकली और बेसिकली यहां पे गाइडलाइंस बड़ी स्ट्रिक्ट हैं very good. And that should be the case everywhere. I mean, Pakistan is not asking for anything uh, more than uh, necessary. Uh, I have two broad questions and I see a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Let me take a couple of broad questions first before we come to those specific questions. A question, you know, that comes to my mind is that, you know, many of us uh, who are early career uh, people, uh, physicians or non-physicians, and they are trying to figure out what's the most bang for the buck, what brings the most value. So how 
useful or research valuable these kind of research are in terms of credibility, importance, research dollar, career advancement, uh, notari notoriety, you know, fame in the community, those kind of things we look for, you know, in, in terms of, of picking what are most valuable things for us to do to develop our career. How satisfying you have found this kind of research line? Yeah, so could you please refer it in a more simple way? What do you want? Yeah, so, you know, if someone wants to do this research, do they think they have a good chance of uh, getting high impact publications, having support for research and funding for their salary dollars, uh, develop credibility, be known and you know famous in their field. How how valuable this kind of research is, uh, you know, in general for as a career advancement. So this is extremely valuable, but it again, when we have to make high impact publication, it's not that easy to make from Pakistan. Again, because you know, credibility matters. So most of the research, uh, I should not say this one because whenever the people approach me, they ask first, will you review paper and give the positive review without sharing the paper? And everybody knows because we have a credibility issue, but, but we need a lot more you know, uh, regulations in Pakistan. But definitely there is a value, value. But the problem is if we have to make a good publication from Pakistan, it's not that easy. Uh, the people who made, actually they just provided the sample, the data. Uh, you can say just purely DNA data, nothing more than that, or clinical data. So all advanced work was done somewhere, written somewhere, published somewhere. So, but we are going in the right direction uh, because it takes time. Even some time uh, I gave a presentation on coronavirus. The people think, oh, how you can give the coronavirus, you know, the talk. Because the, the virus that I am using is adeno associated virus just to rewire the brain circuit is actually the same virus that is being used for the vaccination. So only we, we put the different sequence. So, so suppose if we wanna do uh, this kind of work, it's, it's not that difficult, it's very simple. It has great value. The problem is that, uh, again, uh, we are not that much advanced. We, it, we have not realized what is more important. So why I'm focusing mainly, and even I mentioned <clears throat> earlier that even I have the channel, YouTube channel, just to make people, you know, they should, be aware of how we can uh, control, you know, these genetic disorders. Purpose is that there is a lot more issues and a lot more, uh, you know, ever, every seventh person has been affected by genetic disorder, any genetic defect, not serious, but you can say every seventh <clears throat> has some genetic defect. So there are a lot more. So again, we have to do a lot more and the credibility and the lines and direction is important, also the funding. So once there are highly qualified people and high, highly rated people will work there, definitely we can lift uh, the standard of publication. The last time, you know, Dr. Naveed, he presented a really innovative work. He is the leading person in Canada. A person like him starts work over there and the people who have high impact publication, if they join him, definitely we can make huge difference. Wonderful. That means that if, if once you open up a lab there, either in Aachan or privately, people can join you. That could be another useful way uh, for them to, to establish their career. Kindly also share the link of the channel, the YouTube channel here for the audience and, and send it to us uh, and uh, we will share through our social media networks and platforms. Okay, it's, it's, it's a simple DNA affairs. If you will look for DNA affairs on YouTube, you can find. Viewership is not that much high, so you will be disappointed because it's high, highly educated. We'll, we'll get viewership <laughs> for you. Please do keep doing it. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, promote yeah. the channel through our social media platform. Uh, yeah. One uh, one similar in line, which we are talking about, if Pakistan we want to do projects in Pakistan, or as a log up na career banana chat and they want to pick a career in this kind of translational bench research. Uh, are there potential collaborations internationally that they can work with to get started? 
uh, in terms of guidance, but also support for publications. But and then are there research funding dollars that can be tapped into internationally to to establish this kind of work in Pakistan? Uh, it's not that easy to answer that question. <clears throat> so, but I think they can they can start somehow some collaboration if they if they approach the right person. Like if I'm approached by everybody, <clears throat> so even they're asking me for everything, I can't do everything. So there are a lot more groups within the United States and in Europe that can, they are willing to collaborate. Uh, if they provide something innovative, like uh, some rare genetic disorders, <clears throat> sorry, are even if they can provide the whole exome sequencing that does not cost that much. So I will suggest the people, they should spare some money to do some whole exome sequencing that costs around one thousand to five hundred dollar mean hardly two lakh. So we can manage. Like, why not? We should go for those 10, 20 critical people, critical patients, and we do the whole exome sequencing. Once we have the data in our hands, then we can make better collaboration, and other can spend some other money, and we can do some collaborative work. So, so they have to be, bring some homework first. They have to do yeah, some groundwork. Yeah. If yeah. you do some initial groundwork, then the more expensive or complicated work, then they can get support help with yeah. if they have some initial work. Yes. Yeah. So let's just quickly, before we wrap up for the day, let's quickly answer a couple of these questions uh, that are in the Q&A box. A uh, question is that you mentioned kiya tha medications treatment, you have also mentioned adenovirus-based delivery. Ka bhi zikar kiya hai. So can these kind of drugs be desi designed and developed um, I'm not sure if it's specific to Pakistan, but do you think drugs can be designed to target functional structural disorders of neuron? The precision medicine, may have treatment site with us a comment or getting are there already treatment exists that, that you select from based on the precision medicine uh, initial evaluation, or you actually design new drugs that don't exist after learning more about uh, what is exactly wrong structurally or functionally? So Drug, new drug design you have a Mara field and with totally new area that takes a lot more experts. So drug designing, even if 100 drugs are proposed, karte hain, to wo effective do thing milti hai, aur specificity ja ke ek ki milti hai. So that's huge success. So jo hai, hum jo drugs hum check karte hain, wo already approved hain, lekin we, we don't know the specificity. So our intention was that we have existing anti-epileptic drugs which are not working where they are not working. We will see which is the best for particular genetic variation. So that's something that we have done. That's also precision medicine. But in future, there would be much better drug design because now you know, science is going up and there's a lot more collaborative work. So, I know there are so many people, smart people from Pakistan, and they went back even, but they don't have the resources or they don't collaborate in a way that they, they, they should. We can do everything in Pakistan. I can challenge, I can even make the vaccine. Because if I can make the virus to rewire the brain, uh, why not in Pakistan? Because just you have to use a different sequence, uh, means the corona sequence. So it's, it's, it's not that difficult. The problem is, we are not that much, uh, you know, facilitating the right collaboration, but we are going in the right direction, actually. So that takes time. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Zaman. I think we are 15 minutes over our time. So let me invite uh, Dr. Sayyid Uzair, one of our mentor, the founder of this series of webinar, uh, and a big force behind it uh, for his closing comments and close the session for the day. Dr. Uzair, sir, please go. Um, thank you very much, Danish, and thank you very much, Tariq Zaman. I'm really impressed with your work, and that's really uh, quite amazing work going on, and that's very basic science. And I really appreciate your spirit, really, to link with Pakistan and with Aha Khan and, you know, all those research people. But there are a lot of good things happening here. I'm in Pakistan in these days on trip, and there are a lot of things which are happening here, and I'm quite engaged. And I'll be very happy. There is a, some very interesting news that now in, at the undergraduate level, the curriculum is under review, which I promised in some of my webinar. And now at undergraduate level, 
they must engage in research to get their degrees. So that is going to be mandatory from 1st of August. So that's the latest happening. So I was uh, sitting with Pakistan Medical Commission and they are reviewing the curriculum and your mm -hmm. input is very valuable. We can see, you know, and uh, about a few days ago, I had a meeting with director research with uh, the Miriam Millet University, which is part of Shifa International Hospital and School of Medicine. They are really very eager to involve with the research. They are starting some uh, research PhD programs. So I will collaborate uh, some of the interesting people with you. So I think this is phenomenal and thank you very much for such a great presentation and great piece of work and uh, really impressive. And thank you to all of the people. Thank you, Danish and uh, Sarvat, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining.